Hey, or welcoming. I've been a couple of days here and I was told, why would you come here in November? They told me, you have to come for midsummer, right? And drink some snaps. That's, that's what I was told. Um, so if you haven't noticed for my accent is uh, I'm from Spain and, you know, great contributions to the world like tomato fighting on the street, running with the bulls and the Spanish Inquisition. And I'm going to use those techniques to torture you with 200 marketing slides for the next 40 minutes. Hope you enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm, jokes aside, I'm here to talk about progressive delivery, which is a term that has been uh, coined like last year. In August, it was first uh, seen in Launch Darley. Uh, they built this uh, um, feature flag uh, tool. Then there was another article by Red Monk, the analyst, uh, James Governor, and, and, and he was talking about how great it is progressive delivery. And then I totally said, I'm still in this. I'm definitely love the, the term. It's nothing new, but it's a great term that encapsulates things that we've been doing and we don't have a name for. So that's why I'm here. So it includes uh, all these techniques that you probably heard of before, and I'm going to go through, through some of them, and basically tries to avoid the pitfalls, the problems you have when you are deploying something to everybody or to all your users at the same time, right? If something goes wrong, then you, can, you are affecting all your users, and this is uh, not acceptable anymore. It's something that uh, companies like Facebook, Netflix, all the cool kids are doing. And so it's also something that you can, you can take advantage of. So you deploy new versions, but then you don't replace the existing version. You just run both in parallel. When the old version, the new version, you run them in parallel for a period of time until you are confident and sure that um, the, the new version is going to perform adequately, whether it's performance, memory, uh, or some business outcome like people are buying more than they were buying before, or people are adding things to their shopping carts, whatever, whatever is the metric that you want to you wanna measure on. So it's both correctness and performance that you want to you wanna check before you say, okay, this is, this is good to go for everybody. So one of the things that is trying to do progressive delivery is to make it easier to adopt continuous delivery, right? Continuous delivery is hard. So progressive delivery includes these techniques that help you reduce the risk and, um, and help you yeah, in, uh, implement continuous delivery in an easier way. Some of the techniques that you probably heard of, so rolling updates, this is uh, something that uh, you probably seen before. You can do it with VMs, you can do it with uh, physical machines, you can do it with containers, like Kubernetes includes, uh, this is an example from Kubernetes, automatically includes a rolling update mechanism. So when you have containers and you deploy a new version in Kubernetes, you can say roll update through those containers, through those pods in Kubernetes. So you are just changing one pod at a time instead of changing all those pods at the same time, right? So same thing we've been doing with physical machines, VMs, everything. So totally transparent in Kubernetes if you want to do it. Um, the problems you, ha you have is like you don't have a really fine-grained control. You're just basically saying if you have 10 pods running or 10 machines running, you're just going one, two, three. So it's just 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. If you have one machine running, then it's not really rolling update. If you have another, any other number, um, it's, it varies, right? So there's other technique, blue-green deployment. You have the old version, the green version, the blue version, and the green version. One is old, one is new. I never know which one is which one. Um, so you run both of them at the same time, and you have a router in front of it, you have a load balancer, something like that, reverse proxy, whatever it is. 
and you run both of them, and then at some point you change the router and you say, send all the traffic to the new version. And you can monitor and check that uh, it's behaving correctly. And if for whatever reason it's not behaving correctly, then you just go to the router and immediately switch back to the old version. So it provides you immediate rollback, but it affects every, all the users because you cannot say some users go here, some users go there. Affects 100% of the users, provides you immediate rollback, and it has the drawback that it requires uh, double the resources, right? You have to have both clusters running all the time until you decide that the new version is OK. So an kind of improvement over blue-green deployments, you have canary deployments, where the old version, uh, you send all, most of the traffic to the old version, version 1.0, and you have a new cluster or a new uh, deployment with the version 1.1, and you start sending some traffic to this version 1.1, right? So how do you send this some traffic? You can decide whether you do it geographically. I mean, Facebook and some people, you, they start doing deployments in New Zealand because for whatever reason in New Zealand matches statistically what the US is or something like that. So they try things first in New Zealand before rolling it to the, to the rest of the world. You can also do it just a mere uh, pure percentage of users. You can say 10% of the users are going to the new version and we'll see how it behaves. Or you can do something more, uh, more smarter where you can say, you know, First, we're going to send all the traffic from our internal network, so all the employees, and then we're going to do external people that kind of sign up for some beta or something like that. You can also do HTTP headers. I mean, you can do it uh, as complex as you, as you would like to. And obviously, pr preferably don't do it manually. Don't, do the, don't deploy containers manually. That's not going to scale very well. And one thing I like to, to say is monitoring is the new testing because there's some things that you, c you cannot test, right? You always basically do your tests. You're testing things that you know may fail. But there's always these things that you never know about until they fail, right? So you have to ha implement monitoring to know what are the user issues you're getting in production because there's always new ways Users are going to figure out a way to break your application in new and very innovative ways. And monitoring will tell you when things are, are being broken. And it will, will also allow you to react to these issues automatically, right? And that's, that's, that's the key, right? Automatically. So to quote uh, DevOps Bora, to make error is human, to propagate error to all the servers in an automatic way, that's what DevOps is. And a few years ago, um, we, we were building this, um, this uh, demo for a keynote. Our CEO was gonna do a keynote in a previous company I was working, and it was the main conference for our company and we were running a cluster with uh, th over 300 machines, uh, 2,000, more than 2,000 containers running. And so I'm getting on a flight going to San Francisco, and before I jump in the, in the plane, I see a Slack message, oh, the cluster is down, right? So what happened is one of the, one of the members of the team mistakenly deleted the wrong cluster. And so the whole cluster uh, went down. All the machines were deleted. And you got to realize that even in the cloud, it takes a while for 300 machines to be recreated again and repopulated and everything. But you also, one of the interesting things was like, didn't you realize that when the delete of your cluster was taking over 30 minutes, that you were deleting a big cluster, right? So these are the things that, uh, um, that automation can help you do, but also help you screw it up. But I, I like to say that if you haven't automatically destroyed something by mistake, is that you are not automating enough, right? At some point, you had to do, automate things and learn from, from your failures. So it's all good. 
So the other thing I'm going to talk about is Jenkins X. Uh, who here uses Jenkins? Raise your hand. Like almost everybody. OK. Jenkins X, anybody? One person. Wow. Who, had, who has heard of Jenkins X? OK. So I think the best way to explain what Jenkins X is to Jenkins is like Jenkins X is to Jenkins like Java is to JavaScript. It has nothing to do with Jenkins. It's only the name. Uh, you can run Jenkins inside a Kubernetes cluster, uh, but Jenkins X basically uh, runs totally on Kubernetes. So if you ha don't have Kubernetes, you cannot run Jenkins X. So it's all Kubernetes. And it tries to do a cloud native CI CD uh, engine or, yeah, or tool redesigned from the ground to run on Kubernetes. So it has a lot of components. So it's a, it's a mix of different things. Obviously, we have Docker containers. We have a Nexus repository manager there to speed up the downloads from the internet. And we're using all these other tools from the ecosystem that um, I'll show you. So the main one is probably Tecton. It's a pip pipeline engine in Kubernetes that allows you to run um, the pipeline as different, where different steps are different containers inside a pod. So this is a project that came from Google, from the Knative uh, project, and then it got a split. And it's, it's something that uh, w you've probably seen in other tools like, I don't know, GitHub Actions is also very like container steps. So Tecton allows you to do that in any Kubernetes cluster. Pro implements chat ops. If you haven't heard about chat ops, um, it's where you go into a pull request, for instance, in GitHub, and you have a bot that will answer your commands and it's going to tell you things, right? It's gonna, you can tell the bot, approve this pull request, and the bot is going to automatically approve it and maybe merge if you need one approval. Maybe you need five people, three people to say approve before the bot automatically merges things. So this is the concept of chat ops. You have a bot and you interact with the bot. You can tell the bot, retest this pull request, a, a bunch of things. And Pro will also handle the GitHub webhook. So every time you get something new happening, uh, Pro will gonna get the webhook and create the uh, Tecton configuration and then Tecton is gonna pick up and run the pipeline for you. It uses Helm, uh, is the package manager for Kubernetes. So everything you have together, you put together in your application, you put all those lovely YAML files with your Docker containers, your Docker images, and that's the Helm package that you can, you can deploy. It also uses a scaffold and draft. A scaffold is, uh, we use it, uh, at, in Jenkins X it's used to, to build Docker images, um, abstracting the backend. So a scaffold has support for doing a normal Docker build when you do a, just using the Docker daemon. Um, but it also allows you to do a Canico. Canico is another tool from Google that allows you to do Docker image builds without needing the Docker daemon. This is especially important in Kubernetes clusters where you don't want to give access to, to the Docker daemon. So Canico can, can do Docker image builds inside a container without uh, having a, a needing uh, Docker demo. Also allows you to do Google Cloud Build, so this is some uh, managed service by Google. Or Jib, if you are in the Java world, if you use Maven or Gradle, Jib is another project that uh, allows you to build Docker images from your Maven files. Um, I'm a long time contributor to Maven, so you tell me if you hate it or love it. It's never, never, no, no, nobody stands in the middle. It's either love or hate, one, one or the other. So Jib allows you to just use the plugin, and it will create the Docker image for you with the JDK. And it will also optimize it for your dependencies. So every time, uh, it will create different layers for different jars and uh, to optimize the caching mechanisms in, in Docker images. 
And Draft is used to, uh, this is a project from Microsoft, it used to generate Dockerfile and the Helm charts for any application. So let's say you have an application that is, has nothing more than the application, no Docker files, no Helm charts, nothing. When you import it into Jenkins X, it's going to create for you a Docker file. It's also going to create the Helm charts for you. It's because it looks at your code and says, oh, OK, this is a Java project, so I'm going to create a Docker file that extends the JDK image. And uh, it assumes things, right? Uh, or it's a Golang application, so it's going to pick a different base image. It's going to create different Helm charts for you. And this is going uh, to something that can Jenkins X can do for you when you import a new project into Jenkins X. If it has nothing, it will create it for you. So why progressive delivery and Jenkins X together? So I wrote this. There, there's this guide that I wrote about progressive delivery because it uh, allows you using these two things together, Jenkins X and, and, and the tools I'm going to show you, it allows you to automate all these steps. So one thing it's used is Istio. Anybody here used using Istio? Using it already? Or you're lying? You're lying. Yeah, uh, he was lying. <laughs> okay. So Istio is a kind of complex piece of software. It's a service mesh for your Kubernetes clusters that allows you to do very nice things in an abstracted kind of way. So it allows you to connect different services in your cluster. Um, so you can totally control how the, um, the connections go from one service to another. You can prevent services from talking to others. You can allow some things to talk to other things, but not these other things. So you can control all that. It allows you to secure the end-to-end -end, um, uh, flow. So you can say all the traffic is now encrypted between these services. And another interesting thing that uh, I'm using for this demo uh, that I'll, I'll show you in a second, it allows you to observe and get metrics from your applications without even needing to touch your application, right? Because Istio sits in, the, in between the applications, it will uh, get all the flow for all the traffic, and it will give you metrics on, on that. You can get what is the response time, what is the result of the, of the request, what uh, HTTP code, uh, what error, all these things. You are getting all these things for free just by using Istio. Istio uses Prometheus as the monitoring tool. Um, so ev all these metrics are ending into Prometheus, which is like the monitoring tool of choice for Kubernetes. So all these metrics are ending there, and you can query them. And the more important or critical piece here is Flagger. It's a project that is started by WiffWorks, and it automates the, the promotion of Canary deployments. So basically, Flagger is sitting there looking at your deployments. And when you make a change to your deployment, it's going to say, OK, instead of applying this change, I'm going to just start sending in, uh, small quantities of traffic to this new deployment. So it's going to create a copy of your deployment and start sending traffic to the, to the new version. Of course, this is all configuring YAML that uh, you need the special tools to, 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 to use. And in Jenkins X, you can do it with uh, just changing your Helm chart. You look at the YAML file uh, for your Helm chart. And you can say, OK, Canary, enable it, enable true. And interesting parts on the Canary analysis is uh, you can say, how often do you want to move your Canary, open up your gate? So saying 10%, 20%, how, how often do you want to check? Uh, what's the threshold is how many times the metric has to fail before I roll it back? And the step weight and max weight is the, the steps. So I'm going to send 10% of the traffic up to 50%. So it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and then 100. 
that's the, my canary steps. That's the percentage of traffic that I'm going to send to the new version. And I can set, say, what metrics do I, do I want to use? And these are metrics that are already given uh, by Istio, so I don't have to instrument my application or do anything. So request success rate, I, I want to say that 99% of the requests have to be non-500 errors and check every 60 seconds. And the request duration, I'm saying for the P99, my requests have to be under 500 milliseconds. So these are metrics that I, uh, are in Prometheus, created by Istio. I can add my own. I could say, I don't know, uh, number of items added to my shopping cart. And if the, the shopping cart doesn't have any items for a while, then I'm assuming there's some problem with my application and the users are not able to, to add things to the shopping cart, right? And I can, I can work with that. And the only thing we have to do uh, to take advantage of Canary deployments once I have configured Helm charts is just do a normal deployment with, with Jenkins X, which is uh, JX promote. So I'm moving my application from staging to production. I pass the version, and that's my production push that I can do on Jenkins X. OK, so let me show you the demo. So I have my applications running, one application running, it's Croc Hunter Java, in staging is version 74, in production is version 73, right? Let me show you the app first, here. So this is my production served by Istio, version 73. This is an awesome game that I could be playing here for a long time. So it's shooting crocodiles with lasers, right? That's, that's how cool it is. But obviously, this is not very environmentally friendly. So what I have done in a staging, I have uh, I submitted a pull request. I went through the pull request process, uh, and I th just sending fish to the crocodiles, which is less. Uh, less hurtful for the crocodiles. So I've, I've done these, these changes beforehand. So I have a staging 74, production is version 73. And let's do the, oops. Let's do the promotion. So it's JX promote Croc Hunter Java version 74 environment production. And what this is going to do, uh, Jenkins X also uses the concept of GitOps. What this is going to do, is this is going to create a pull request in my production environment, uh, of, of course using YAML, because why not? And here it is. It has created a pull request that says Croc Hunter Java to version 74, if you look at the files changed, and uh, there's a YAML file that lists all the dependencies in my uh, production environment, and there's a similar repo for the staging environment, and it's saying, okay, just change the version to 74. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the chat ops. Uh, I have a bot that says this, well, this is going to be automatically approved uh, because it's a promotion build, but I can do very interesting things, very useful stuff, uh, to talk to my bot, so I can say meow, and I'm getting pictures of cats, right? And eventually, this uh, will do a build check, and I'll get the, okay, here are the logs. I'm just, uh, is this going to show how this uh, pipeline runs and checks that everything is okay, the Helm chart uh, uh, goes through some tests, before pushing it to, to production. And once that happens, it will automatically merge my, my pull request. OK, so this is the promotion build. And this has to finish executing. And while that happens, let me start another screen here. Uh, 
this. Okay, so this is hitting my production environment. I'm basically printing the version that is deployed. So that's returning 73 all the time for now. I'll leave that running. And okay, the pull request has to be merged. This is all running in Kubernetes engine, the Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes offering. So I have now auto scaling cluster. Right now it's four VMs, a virtual CPUs. I can also see my workloads here. I can go, there's a lot of stuff. And there is a Croc Hunter Java. I have one in production, one in staging. I can see all this stuff in my, uh, okay, not this one. I have two deployments, one for the canary. Okay, here is the primary. One for the primary. And I can see all the information. I can see how much memory, CPU, all these, all these metrics are, are being uh, gathered by Google. What the other thing, when this is gets deployed, which probably is in the process. These are my flagger logs. This is where I'm gonna see how flagger detects there's a new deployment and it's gonna do the rollout. So as soon as that happens, I can show you more things. So this is my, my application, Crow Hunter Java. And if I show you for instance, this is what I did before the demo because to, to avoid it being too long and the building stuff. Jenkins X has the concept of pull request environments. So whenever you create a new pull request, the bot is gonna tell you PR built and available in this preview environment. This is a new Kubernetes namespace. And if this is was probably destroyed already, oh no, not yet. So if I go there, I can see uh, my pull request being deployed uh, in a separate place. So I, me as a pull request reviewer, I can come here and see, oh, everything looks good before saying approve. So every time you create a new pull request, it's gonna create a new, new environment for you. And I said approve, and the pull request was, was uh, merged. The bot says the pull request was approved by this guy. Um, and it was merged and automatically deployed to a staging. A staging environment is always automatically uh, updated from master and production is manual, but you can have any environments you want and you can configure them differently. Okay, here it is something. So Flagger has uh, is a new revision detected, the scaling up uh, the Canary, a starting Canary analysis and advanced JX Croc Hunter uh, wait 10. So now it's sending 10% of the traffic to the new to the new version. And if you see it here, for instance, is version 74. If you see it here, this request is also getting version 74. So depending on that 10%, that's getting that's getting the new version. I can also see uh, where do I have it here. This is I need to open. Uh, okay. So is uh, Flagger includes a Grafana dashboard, so you can see side by side your previous version and the new Canary version. So on the left, I have a previous version. On the right, half, I have the Canary version. And I can see the request success rates, volume, uh, duration, CPU, stuff like that. All these metrics side by side. And if I probably, if I hit this w enough times, I would get the new version. There's always some caching sometimes. But, uh, okay, there it is. So I have the new version and some percentage of the users are getting it, right? So, so far, so good. 
But what can happen, uh, so you see uh, the rollout is continuing. This one is saying now 20%, 30%. So this is going to continue to 50 and to 100. But what can happen is here. Okay, create this F. I'm going to introduce some errors. By the way, if you want to become a 7x engineer, just alias kubectl to k, and then you save seven times typing all over every time. And that's, that's going to save you a lot of time. So I just have to do k. And this is injecting some, uh, OK, this is going on to 40% while well, I'm injecting traffic. Uh, issues. Oh. Let me open again Grafana. Let's le take a look at the dashboard here. You can see that the incoming success rate has dropped to 82%, right? I'm injecting errors and I'm, I'm making it fail by on purpose to show you how this would work. So eventually Flagger is going to look at this matrix and say, you know, there's, there's a problem with this, and I'm going to do something about it. Let's see here. The trick is to do it before it gets to the end, because if it gets to 50, then I have to start again from, from scratch. So eventually, so it checks every minute. I think I have configured it for three failures. So if you get three failures, then it's going to roll it back. If you can see it here, HALT, uh, Croc Hunter, Advancement, Success Rate is 87%, which is lower than the target I set, 99%. So what it's doing first is halting the advancement. It's halting the Canary uh, deployments. It's just keeping it at 40%. So three times uh, I have set it three times uh, failure. And then it's going to roll it back. And while that happens, I'll, I'll show you. I continue a little bit. So the way this works in detail, so we have Istio virtual services, and we have two deployments with their own services. So we have the primary and canary. And Istio can send. One of the things that it's still can do is uh, traffic control. So you can configure this virtual service by hand by changing the YAML files to send traffic to one or another or send a percentage or do it any as complicated as you want. But what we have is we have Flagger doing this automatically for us. It looks at the metrics from Prometheus uh, and it changes the it looks at the Kubernetes API and changes the virtual service automatically. And the other thing you can get is uh, Slack, well, this is the Grafana I show you. You can also get the Slack messages if you want. And if you don't have enough Slack messages in your organization, you can get more. And uh, you can get whether the rollout is going successfully or it's, it's failing. And if you're curious, this application is done with Quarkus. That is a, a native Java stack that probably somebody is going to talk about Quarkus in this, in this conference. And uh, it allows you to even compile to, to native bytecode. So it's very interesting for building in very small Docker images, if you want. Um, I'm not doing that because it takes like 10 minutes to do the compilation. And so for the demos, it's, it's just a bit too long. But you can, you can check it out. And well, this runs. OK, there it is. Almost there. So there was another error and another error so the next time this should automatically roll it back so almost there in the meantime this is continuing yeah getting probably 40 percent of the traffic to the new version and uh, everything is going to the to the old one uh, Oops, what happened here? There it is. So rolling back, failed checks, result reached three. And canary failed, scaling down. 
production oops here it is so if I go back to my my curl call you can see that all all the requests are returning 73 so it's the old version and if I go to the application uh, it's version 73 again so I didn't have to change my application I didn't have to do anything like that in exchange, I had to add a lot of more complexity to my Kubernetes cluster, but that's that's the trade-off. I didn't have to add any metrics. I didn't have to instrument my application. I didn't have to watch for the Canary rollout to see if it works or it doesn't. It's all like hands off, right? It's If it fails, it will automatically be rolled back. If it works, it will automatically be rolled out. So th this is something that you can do in any Kubernetes cluster today. So you don't need to need be uh, Facebook or Netflix to do to do Canary deployments. So I'm gonna take a couple of questions before I close it out. So if you ask me two questions, ask me one question. We're going down. You wanna ask? Yes. If I use this progressive deployment, what uh, there will be an inconsistent state in the in my deployment, right? That's something that uh, you have to check because there's when you do Canary deployments, yes, you may say, you know, I want to do Canary deployments for a day or maybe two days, but if you are constantly deploying things, you're gonna end have a lot of experiments happening, right? So this is something that you have to manage uh, somehow, this, the complexity of, of doing this. Uh, you could do very, I don't know, a very small canary where you say, you know, a, a small percentage uh, for a day, for, for a few hours or something, so you don't have many going on, so you just do checks that say, okay, the application didn't blow up, right? So you do a canary to check just if the application blows up or not. But th there's people that do more advanced things like user, end-to-end -end user checks, right? Like I was talking about the uh, shopping cart. If the shopping cart, uh, and that requires some time, obviously, yeah. Yes? Is there a nice way to deal with breaking changes? Yeah, don't break anything, yes. If you change the database, I love this question because every time all somebody asks about the database. If you, are, if you have a database, obviously that's something that you cannot roll back or do things. If you have a schema changes and stuff like that. So my advice has always been before doing um, a schema change, your you, you change your application so you can deal with both versions of the schema for a while first. And then you ensure that application can work with both versions of the schema, and then you change the schema. That way, if you have to roll back your application, you can roll it back, or the database, you can roll it back to another version that already can handle both versions of the schema. That's kind of the trick. So you can ask me questions later, I'll be around. Uh, I would tell you to buy my book, but it's not mine. Um, I wrote the chapter about progressive delivery uh, with Victor Farsik and the DevOps 2.6 toolkit. And uh, well, I hope you you tr you learn something and you get the chance to to give it a try in your in your work or your hobby pro uh, your hobby Kubernetes cluster that you have at home. And uh, thank you, Tech.